But I'm now joined by the Dwyan, the godfather, as I said earlier, the Don Corleone of Euroscepticism, Sir William Cash. Good Bill. evening, Jacob. Good evening. Now, this issue of retained EU law, yes. the getting rid of those rules that make our economy uh, less efficient, you had a promise from the Prime Minister that he would deal with this. Well, that's certainly quite clearly what I understood the case to be, and I'm just hoping that we stick to it when this Cabinet Committee has done its discussions, which I think is tomorrow, so I hear. So it really is important. i just add a slight gloss to what you said, because I think it's very important for people to hear, to understand, and sometimes it's not made sufficiently clearly, that these laws that were made over the 50-year period we were in the European Union were made by qualified majority voting of the other countries and behind closed doors without even so much as a transcript. Can you imagine the House of Commons not having Hansard, for example? This is what the way these laws are made. So it, they lacked democratic legitimacy. And now we've got out, it's absolutely essential that we deal with those laws appropriately and we get rid of them or we modify them in a way that will make them genuinely United Kingdom laws. Um, but these laws that were passed secretly, potentially by qualified majority vote. We've now operated with them for years. Why does it matter now, or is it essentially old hat? No, it's very important right now that we get rid of them for the re this good reason, that actually you can't have two statute books. You can't have one lot of laws which are governed by principles of EU law, which were in embedded in the legislation when we went in under the European Communities Act, where we voluntarily and wrongly abdicated our sovereignty, and then subsequently those laws, when they were made, were enforced by the European Court of Justice. And it's absolutely essential that we weed out the uh, manner in which those laws were made, because they were made with different interpretations. The judges came to different conclusions. You can't have that lot. And then also the laws that are made after we left the European Union, in other words, you'd have two statute books, and that would be very uncertain and very confusing for people. But, because one of the criticisms made of repealing all this law is that it will lead to uncertainty for business. Aren't businesses happier with the rule book remaining as it is, not having change, just sticking to it? Well, for the reasons that you gave earlier, the trouble is that when these laws were being made in this Council of Ministers behind closed doors, etc., actually, they were also being made in a way that was by collusion and by consensus. And there were, never was a level playing field. I mean, I've been uh, on the European Scrutiny Committee, believe it or not, since 1985. And that's a long time. I've seen an awful lot of these things. I've been on many, many of these uh, laws and had to give opinions on the legal and political judgment on it. But basically, the, re the reality is that we've now got to get rid of them because they are actually not in British interest. Some we can live with. I agree with that. But uh, the majority of them have to go. And there are about eight, about, about 4,000 of them. But you saw the clip that we showed and you had the personal commitment from the Prime Minister that he would get rid of them. Why should that have changed now? Has the government found something that makes it particularly well, I have difficult? No, well, I have no idea at the moment because I'm not in the position to be able to say. I mean, we, we'll hear about what amendments are being proposed in the House of Lords. And also bear in mind, this, the, this bill went through on the very day that he became Prime Minister, as it happens, that afternoon, and I think you stepped aside on that very day, as it happened, but there we are. You're absolutely right. I did business Correct. questions as a minister, you did. or based questions as a minister, and then I spoke but, from the back. But it then on the went debate. on to second reading that very day, and uh, with all the promises of the uh, uh, manifesto, and our manifesto is full of repealing laws, deregulating, and all the rest of it. But do you have some sympathy for the Prime Minister that there's a busy schedule of legislation to get through the House of Lords? The House of Lords hates this bill because it's stuffed to the gunnels with um, <clears throat> Europhiles. Uh, it's going to take a lot of time in the Lords, and there are other bills that need to be got through. No, and therefore, if you give in to the Lords, if you let them water it down, it'll make the rest of the ambitious programme that the Prime Minister has easier to get through. Now, you know I won't buy into that one at all. The, the bottom line is that the second reading of that bill on that very day when he became Prime Minister went through with a very large majority. 
and it remained unamended through the whole of the proceedings in the House of Commons. It then went to the House of Lords, and actually at this moment in time, the bill is itself unamended in the House of Lords. So everything is ready to go. Everything is ready to get the bill through as quickly as possible. And the next question is, what are they going to come up with by way of amendments, if that's what they do? And remember, the House of Lords, of course, is an unelected body. So it would be the House of Lords telling the House of Commons that they got it wrong. And I find that really deeply worrying. And though after a coronation weekend, we see the virtues of having unelected parts of our constitution. Yes. Ultimately, power must rest with the democratic arm. Absolutely. And that is the most fundamental of our constitutional principles. And the constitutional monarchy can be demonstrated by royal assent of an act of parliament. When Her Majesty, the late Majesty the Queen, and I saw the, um, the, the, the uh, uh, coronation back in 1953, when she made her signature on one of those acts of parliament, it was royal assent by somebody on behalf of the United Kingdom. During the time that we were actually in the European Union, became something else because we were rubber stamping the laws that they had made. And then now the king, when he puts the words royal assent to the, an act of parliament, that will be his sovereign act as the king of the United Kingdom. That's what I want to see. And I don't want it to get caught up into a quagmire of some being pre-Brexit and therefore being governed by European principles. I want them to be decided by the voters of this country through their members of parliament. That's the way our constitution functions. Restoring our freedoms. Well, thank you so much, Sir William.